I love the city man, knowing the Lord had called me to preach when I was a teen. Wanted to be discipled and trained, so that led me to the South. And after a few years in the South, the Lord called me back in. 20 years old. And I knew the Lord had called me to preach this gospel and make disciples here, to fulfill the commission. We have this in Maine, we have this in common with a lot of uh, little Caribbean islands. That, you know, that there's a side of the island that is all resorts. And then behind the fences, there's a, a poor uh, community. And the state of Maine is like that in many ways. And so I, I'm from the poor part. I'm from the, the um, rural, central, northern, eastern Maine. And so the Lord burdened my heart for this people, where I was born and did my, my growing up. Came back here, officially started Calvary Chapel, 1985. So how many years has that been? However many years that's been, me and Matt are tight. It's been that long. I was young and I didn't have a scheme or a plan. I really had nothing more than the example, you know, of Pastor Chuck and others and the Great Commission. The commission was to make disciples. That 20th chapter of Acts, that, that um, little pastor's conference with the Apostle Paul and the elders from Ephesus is significant because he tells us that discipleship is verbal instruction together with modeling it. And it is being with people through seasons and doing those seasons, demonstrating how seasons are to be done by somebody who is actually living and demonstrating faith. Real discipleship is sharing your life with somebody. Verbal instruction, but also with the daily demonstration, consistent demonstration that this is what we do. This is what this principle looks like. And if you're discipling, then you're discipling people to disciple. You're discipling disciplers. You're training trainers. Being fortunate to have received so much, I was conscious of the need to invest much in men. You see somebody worthy of that investment, um, spend time with them. And it was, so it wasn't like, a, you know, it wasn't like a big scheme that we looked at the map and did demographic studies and had some war room. Some, there was no such thing. It was just a matter of passing on truths and encouraging people to go tell other people those same truths. We have to be willing to send, have to be willing to let go. It is just like raising our own children. We raised them to go. We can't keep them. We can't, we can't carry them or we rip them off. We gotta sooner or later put them down, make them deal with gravity themselves and just encourage them to take steps and then the greatest thrills in life are them overcoming gravity, jumping, leaping, jumping bikes, and, you know, building ramps, doing stunts. Um, we have to be thinking of the big picture and not our ministry. We're thinking about the cause of Christ. And I think also we have to be thinking about their best interest, the, these guys. If we don't send them, we'll rip them off. And, and we have to be willing to, to lose good people for that cause, for the sake of the cause, and trust the Lord to provide other good people, and we'll make the investment in them, train them up. And what's the alternative? Who do you want to send? All the people that we don't get along with? No, no, it should be painful. The Great Commission for us to go should cause us pain. Pain is a part of love. If we don't hurt, then we don't truly love. So it ought to be a continual hurt of parting people going until we get to heaven in this one massive reunion. It's going to be part of what makes heaven heaven. Think about um, the words of the author of Hebrews, who I personally believe is Paul, saying, For, forsake not the assembling of yourselves together, as is the matter of such, even more so now, as, as you see the hour approaching. So assemblies are important, according to the scripture, especially in the light of the lateness of the hour. So to me, planting churches is sending someone to fulfill a commission, and then to assemble. That, that to me, that's the, the pastor's job, is to call the assembly. And it's not just assembling like just getting together. It's assembling like my little boy. My boy Ben is a Lego maniac, and it's all about fitting. Assemb think about assembling yourself together in light of the Lego mind. And 
things have got to be fit together. And that, to me, is, you know, it's the work of God, but he uses people. He uses pastors. So the Lord is building. He's always building. He's a wise master builder. And all of us, like living stones, are being fit together. The men and women that go out from us have to go out knowing their mission is the word of God, imparting the word of God, standing on the word of God, contending for it, and making the case for the truth of it continually. Nothing else. They're not going out there to make people feel good or to be popular. Success is only measured by God in ways that men can't even understand. They include things like, were we obedient? Whether, whether a big thing ever happened or not. Success is measured by God by whether somebody did what he sent them to do. Not how it was responded to by the people. Yeah. How does the Lord show you that somebody's ready to go? The question is, who's ever really ready? Even when we're in ministry for decades, we're still over our heads. We're going to be perpetually over our heads, perpetually out of our weight class, out of our life form class, and a fight that requires miraculous supernatural help. So, so the, the, the term ready is what I have to giggle at. Be, but at the same time, I am dependent upon individuals hearing from God, not from me. They need to hear from the Lord. The Lord has got to have burdened them, has got to have done in them what he did in me. And that is, whatever a burden is to me, it is uh, a God-imposed sense of responsibility for a people that would make them go and join that people and become part of a community, make them uproot, make them be willing to uproot and go there and get a job and just be part of that that town, that people. When you see that, I mean, you, you have to acknowledge that's something God has done. We don't really send anyone out any more than we ordain. We just acknowledge that God has. But I can throw it out there. You guys, God wants to use you, and there's a need, and the need is in every direction. We need more churches. We need more of you to hear from God. Talk to the Lord. It's kind of simple to recognize leaders because there's people following them. Nobody's a leader if they are not first a man under authority. And men who are under authority have authority. And it's demonstrated by the fact that people look to them. It's easy to see that people are going to them and getting their counsel, that people are following their example or they're following their, their lead. And that, that, that is the way to identify a leader is, are there people following them? In some cases, there are guys who you look at and you go, you know too much to be just sitting here nodding. You know too much. You need to go take what you know somewhere. There are people who need to know what you know, and I can't go. But at the same time, there's always somebody who thinks that God has sent them. I have learned to identify that. The person who thinks God sent them, and they are full of baloney. You know, and that's, you know, the guy who, who comes and goes, yeah, I mean, God's calling me to go start a church in this place somewhere. And I go, are you even doing the things that he gave you to do here? Because you're not doing that. And you're trying to tell me that God's calling you. All I can tell you is I think you're crazy. You're wrong. And... I have learned the hard way. Every time there's any sort of a, I don't know how we word it, because I hate the word feeling. You know that. People feel everything. There's all this too much feeling. We just feel, we just feel like God's leading. There's no feel. The apostles didn't use the word feel ever. So how do you describe the phenomenon? Well, you sense in your spirit. I sense. There are times when somebody will come and go, I believe God's called me to go to whatever. And in my heart, I'll be like, the, the conflict is, I want to be gracious, and who am I, right? I'm not the Lord of the harvest. I will talk to him about it. So on one hand, you want to be gracious and say, I, but at the, on the other hand, something to say, you're going, no stinking way. That guy is, all he wants to do is talk about himself. And that's going to turn into something when he's in the position of pastor. And every time I have not listened to that two or three times, uh, where I have been in that situation, and every time I have learned that I should have, you know. But when it comes to a couple, you also have to see that the Lord has dealt with that wife, too. That man's not dragging her off against her will, going, woman, you need to submit to me, because that would be stupid. That's a recipe for trouble. If I were to see that, I would say that you need to wait till the Lord's dealt with your wife's heart.
until he's until he has given you the level of confidence in her heart that she can follow you where you're leading. And if you see that isn't the case, then you got to go. Don't go. Do not go. You know, at least encouraging them. Wait until God has done that. Wait until this marriage has grown. Wait until that relationship with her has grown to where she actually now believes in you enough that she'll go anywhere. We decide the only people we support financially are those who have gone to foreign countries where they're not allowed to work. You know, they're prevented by their visa from working. But everybody else, man, you just got to go just like I did, just like I think the, the Apostle Paul did. I go make tents. So it is the lack of financial support that becomes one of the truest tests as to whether or not man is really called to that place. If we were to support someone financially, even for a year to get established, I think we take away the most important opportunity for them but to, to prove, to be tested, and also to experience God's supernatural provision. So we don't, we don't support anybody financially if they're going somewhere where they can get a job, go work. That's it. That's our support. We support them by giving them nothing. <laughs> it, it's important to communicate. If you don't get together regularly, you drift. Drift happens. If you don't communicate regularly, either by phone or text, or get together, see each other for conference a couple times a year, there's a, there's a drift. And then, then there are things that come up in every relationship, whether they're near or far. There are conflicts that come up that you got to spend time together and make sure that things are good. I have lost a couple. I'm talking about relationally lost a couple of guys that we sent out, but it's always the result of some kind of offense, some kind of significant disagreement and you know, confrontation always comes right down to how does the man respond to the confrontation? How does he respond to the attempted correction? And a man will either submit himself or not. Everybody's only as submitted as they want to be. So in every situation, I have discovered that you cannot over communicate. You got to stay in touch. And, you know, it is clear to us from the pastoral epistles that the Apostle Paul, who's our best example on this, only because we have more written by him, those pastoral epistles are evidence that he stayed in touch. It was nowhere near as easy for him. Those letters were delivered by a, a courier. They had to be carried from one land to another. Think about how he went out of his way to write to them, to address issues. and. Uh, encourage them or warn them. I think that it's important that we stay in touch. And we have to make an effort. It has to be deliberate.